Hi, uh, this is John Byrne with Poets and Quants. Welcome to our webinar on exploring a career in fintech. We have a really interesting crew of people for you. We have three Harvard MBAs, a Stern MBA from NYU, and a Kellogg MBA. All five of them work for uh, an MBA startup, Common Bond, uh, which has been a real pioneer in the fintech space, originally founded by uh, three Wharton MBAs, in fact. Uh, I want to introduce each of them to you. They come from very different fields, consulting, banking, uh, brand management, strategy. So we have a lot of different perspectives uh, and why they've actually chosen to um, get into fintech. So let me start with uh, Dave Carter. He's Senior Director of Business Development at Common Bond. And Dave is their NYU Stern uh, MBA who had done management consulting work at Accenture uh, before joining Common Bond. So welcome, Dave. Uh, then we have Jesse Taylor. Jesse uh, sort of leads marketing for Common Bond's graduate in-school lending products. That includes their original product, MBA Loans. Uh, before joining Common Bond, she worked in brand management at Kraft Heinz. And of course, she's from Kellogg, the marketing school, right? Of course, Kellogg is a lot more than just marketing. <laughs> then uh, I'm thinking that next to her, uh, and I can't see because you're in a tiny little thumbnail on my screen is is uh, Veena Ramaswamy, uh, who is, is that right? Yep. Good. Okay. And she's VP of strategy at Common Bond and uh, graduated from Harvard with uh, an MBA. And uh, she joined uh, Common Bond from, from Morgan Stanley's uh, corporate strategy and M&A group. Uh, and then we have, and I might not be able to get this right, Tara Fung. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Oh, good. Okay, now I can see you much better. Good. Now I'll know who you are. Uh, and you lead uh, Common Bond's enterprise business, which is focused on uh, student loan benefits uh, to employers. Uh, prior to Common Bond, you worked in manufacturing for a very well-known uh, German automotive giant. Uh, and you were involved in international strategy and project management roles there after getting your uh, MBA at Harvard. And then finally, but certainly not least, uh, we have Sarah Winters, who's senior manager in strategy at Common Bond, focused on strategic partnerships. Uh, before joining Common Bond, uh, she had worked uh, in Accenture's financial service customer and channel practice. So, oh, and she is also a Harvard MBA. So welcome everybody. So why in the world did you want to abandon all those in incredible jobs that you had and join uh, a 100 person startup, Common Bond, uh, and work in FinTech? Who wants to go first? DC, yeah, I, I feel can, you should speak to this I one. can take sure. It's the ping pong table, that's what it is. Uh, <laughs> we have one of those too. Yeah, well, there you go. Um, no, for me, I, uh, I was doing a lot of government consulting before. Uh, going back and getting my MBA, uh, which for anyone who has experienced government consulting, uh, it's a big difference than working for a small company. Uh, I can tell you that working for a small company, uh, you have a lot of ownership, and that's what I really wanted. And so uh, looking at what I was good at when it came to uh, consulting, uh, a lot of the client relationships, I really liked uh, upselling clients, things of that nature, uh, that really led itself into a career in business development, which is creating partnerships here at Common Bond to help drive business to our, to our three business lines. Um, and then that in turn uh, really made a lot of sense to come to, to NYU Stern. Uh, NYU Stern is actually how I found out about uh, Common Bond uh, and Poets and Quants actually. There's an article uh, on Poets and Quants about uh, taking out loans with Common Bond about four or five years ago. I found it through there, ended up taking out wow. a loan with Common Bond, fell in love with Common Bond as a consumer, came on as an intern in between my first two years, and then ended up quitting uh, the full-time program at NYU Stern, starting here full-time, creating the BD function here at, at Common Bond, uh, and m moving to the part-time program at Stern. So it's been a, a phenomenal experience for me, um, but I will go back and say it's all about ownership and getting that owner mentality here. And I should point out that Dave Carter uh, paid for his entire MBA education, right? <laughs> Common <laughs> Bond paid for it. Yeah. I have to pay them back now. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, Tara Fung, I worked at a very big company before business school, Daimler AG, German Automotive, 300,000 people globally. 
Um, I didn't actually know what I wanted to do when I got out of business school. So business school, the purpose of it was to have time to figure out what I wanted to do and also right. um, to enable the springboard into another career because I knew I did want to make a change. I got to know Common Bond in between my first and second year of business school um, and was also similarly impacted by the company, the founder, the vision. And for me, coming out and joining a fintech company was great for a few things. One, it helped me be close to technology in a way that coming from a business background, I knew if I joined another big company out of school, I would not be close to technology. And I feel like technology is changing the way we do everything. So I wanted to have a better appreciation and understanding for that. And then FinTech in particular, they valued my MBA background. And so I didn't want to join a company where my MBA wasn't seen as an asset. It could potentially even be seen as a detriment. And so FinTech together just seemed to work really well. Makes sense. Who wants to talk? Yes, this is Vina. I'll just add from my perspective, um, I had worked at a large bank, as you mentioned, I was at Morgan Stanley before coming to Common Bond. And for me, it was a, the, what was compelling to me about joining a, a small fintech company was that it was a company that was creating products and services with the consumer um, at its center um, and solving um, real customer pain points. So, you know, the Common Bond story and origination is um, from Wharton's MBA campus and our founder had to figure out a way to pay for school. And so um, that authentic kind of mission and um, focus on building products that really serve a customer need um, was compelling to me and different from working at a large institution. And Je Jesse, you've been there just over a year. How hard was the transition from going uh, from uh, a big company like Kraft Heinz to Common Bond? Yeah, and a great question. Um, so I actually was pleasantly surprised um, on how unchallenging, kind of simple it was to transition. I think what Dave mentioned was, you know, something that united both Kraft Heinz and working at Common Bond is that sense of ownership and, you know, having a lot of autonomy to run your own projects, working on really lean teams, um, you know, having more of that scrappy, fast-paced mentality. So even though, you know, the, com the total company sizes are vastly different, kind of your day-to-day -day teams you're working with, this sense of responsibility um, was very similar. Uh, so even though, yeah, and it kind of speaks to what the types of companies that I was looking at, even while in business school, I wasn't necessarily straight out of the gate looking at startups um, or smaller firms. I was focused on those bigger CPG companies, uh, but really ones that had that entrepreneurial mindset um, and where I could kind of hit the ground running. So in that sense, I think the cultures um, were a little bit more similar and that lent itself to easier transition despite very different both industries, types of products, types of distribution of the products, um, as well as the size. Sarah, because there's so many MBAs at Common Bond, is it kind of like uh, being in class again or what? <laughs> um, some days, uh, no, but I think really what it is is it's much more of a practical application of a lot of what we learned in MBA. Um, and especially in the role that I have with strategic partnerships, a lot of what I use every day is all of the influencing skills that I really learned when I was at HBS. Um, and it really helps me be more effective with you know, all of the partners that we work with and everyone on the team here. So let's go back into your, uh, just for a moment at least, your MBA education. And, and tell me how uh, can help prepare you for uh, a role in a FinTech company. Who wants to go? So uh, you're cut out a little bit in your question, but I think the question was, how did your MBA help you for a role at a fintech company? Um, I yes. See that. So that and were there that. classes in particular that kind of prepared you for it? Yeah, um, I would actually piggyback to that question, what Sarah said a little bit, um, in terms of specific classes that I found um, helpful that I would say I would still use today um, in, in a role here is like, negotiations. Um, I actually found at HBS, I have this class that most people think is boring, but I found super useful called Board of Directors and Corporate Governance, um, which, you know, when you're creating and working at an emerging growth company, um, those are the types of questions and decisions that come up um, as you are continuing to build out the company. So um, those are the two classes for me that I still find valuable um, from my experience um, at HBS. Yeah, there was actually... Beyond just the classes, one of, I think, the most impactful experience I had was working on an e-commerce case competition while in business school. So I think working in real time about an e-commerce company that was trying to appeal to millennials was actually very applicable 
anything about fintech. Our product lives online. The way you, people search for the product and purchase the product replicates a lot of e-commerce retail strategies. So, you know, at the time, I was just curious about that company um, who was hosting the case competition and wanted to just try something new. And now it's only looking back that I'm like, oh, hey, like actually, that's very helpful, especially when I had to make that transition from marketing consumer products that you buy at the grocery store versus taking out a financial service product that you purchase online. So, you know, I think that's another area. You kind of do a lot of things in business school and you can try a lot of things and you can only really connect the dots looking backwards. So just doing what seems interesting at the time and it'll probably be valuable in some space. Moving and Dave, forward. you had you had the benefit, Dave, of uh, finishing off your MBA part-time while working at Common Bond. So you could actually apply what you learned in the classroom at work immediately, right? Uh, that's a great point. Uh, and I would say that my focus on choosing classes definitely shifted uh, once I moved to the part-time program. As soon as I moved to the part-time program, it was less about you know, having a, a good time and more about getting this done, learning as much as I can, and then really being effective at work. That was number one. Uh, and so I would highly recommend every single person take a negotiation class like Gina mentioned. That was instrumental to what I do. I'm negotiating nearly every day, um, but also a sales class. I think everyone should go to a sales class, especially if you're looking to be either a founder at a company, obviously in a sales part of a company, or you want to lead a company as a CEO. Uh, those are all sales related jobs and you should know the sales skills related, needed to be successful. We have, we have a good question from a member of the audience and I'm just gonna poke it in. And the person asked, do you think uh, you would have been able to do the same things without an MBA that you're doing today? Yeah, um, Tara, I'll take a stab at that. So for me personally, an MBA accomplished a few things. Um, and one of them was attaching a brand to my name that would open doors effectively. So I went to a state school for undergrad. It was an amazing experience, but especially outside of that state in particular, it didn't cause people to look at my resume and actually say, hey, I'm going to have a conversation with you. And when you're a student, also, as at any of the top MBA programs, you're able to have conversations with people um, that normally wouldn't happen. Like, as you are in such a special place when you're this MBA student who can reach out to a company and say, hey, I'd love to learn more about either an MBA program or what you're doing. Would you be able to sit down um, and talk with me if I buy you coffee? Um, there's a great alumni network I know people talk about a lot as well. And so for me personally, it did allow me to change career paths in a way that I would not have been able to do outside of getting the MBA. Um, and from the specific skills gained during the MBA as well, I think it was hugely valuable. Others have spoken to what classes were impactful for them. Um, the entrepreneurial manager and managing the financial firm are two classes I took at HBS that definitely applied directly to my role here and are things that I did not know how to do or problems that I hadn't thought about prior to those courses. I should point out that Tara went to the University of South Carolina for her undergraduate degree in economics. So Actually, my daughter went to uh, USC as well. So there you go. I, touches my heart. Uh, Every uh, time someone says USC, I know they mean California. And I'm like, but I in know. South Carolina, <laughs> it means South Carolina. <laughs> Any, anyone else on, uh, could you do what you do without an MBA? You, you know, some people might be able to, but the truth is what Tara said is right. Uh, that the degree simply opens doors that would otherwise be closed. It gives you a look. Uh, because getting a job at Common Bond is a very competitive process. Uh, I know your CEO well, and I know <laughs> uh, he's a tough dude, and I'm, he probably asked really tough <laughs> questions. So um, having that MBA and being prepared for that, uh, you know, the MBA also gives you self-confidence, and uh, I think that's a big deal. I think the MBA is a great opportunity to make a pivot as well. Kind of if you're looking, yep. I was looking to move from – marketing and advertising on the agency side to you know marketing and really being in the driver's seat on the quote client side or brand side and kind of taking that step back and gaining some of those technical skills and you know, having that name on your resume as well just enables you to pivot a little bit more drastically than you might be able to or kind of have the time to if you're just rushing from one job to the next. What I find interesting about all five of you is that you actually chose something else in your immediate post MBA career before coming to FinTech. So you actually made several transitions already uh, as young as all of you are. 
And in fact, one uh, other uh, person in the audience is saying, well, did any of you take uh, MBA courses actually focused in FinTech while you were in business school? They didn't have them when I was at HBS. I don't know. There you go. Yeah, so I, I did. I took managing the financial firm, which there uh, was a whole module on financial technology. And I'm, I think I am the one person on the panel. I did join Common Bond directly out of my MBA. So I haven't job switched uh, post MBA. Right. It's been three <laughs> years. So uh, I actually took a course on strategy and technology, which while not focused on FinTech in particular, was just focused on like companies doing things that are different within the technological space. Um, so it, there were parallels there. Right, exactly. So uh, let's let's go back to that. Uh, Tara came immediately to Common Bond, so she knew she wanted to work for a fintech firm, and she knew she wanted to work in a smaller environment as opposed to a big uh, bureaucratic company. Uh, and things are very fast moving at Common Bond. Well, you people are working really hard, I know, and you, all of you have a great deal of uh, authority. Uh, in in uh, at Common Bond, uh, but how did you how did you pick your first job other than Terror? I mean, how did you end up doing what you did, and then ultimately uh, making the detour uh, to Common Bond? Want to bring us through some of those career decisions that you made? Yeah, I have. I had a very actually, believe it or not, I don't know if you guys can believe this. I had a very methodical way of doing it, um, and I, I read it in a book. Yeah, right. Uh, three points. No. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, I read in a book that you should make three lists. Uh, first list, three, three points, it's always three points. Um, the first list is uh, a list of the things that you are good at, right? So it's like the skills that you are very good at. Ask your colleagues, ask your relatives, what are your skills? Be very brutally honest there. Next is what, um, what you're good at. Next is what, uh, what someone will pay you to do, right, out of that list. And then the final list is what you like to do, right? And the culmination of those three lists will actually give you a really good view as to what you're good at, what you will enjoy doing for a long time, and then what someone will pay you to do. For me, a lot of it was the client relationship type, tough, type stuff that I mentioned before, uh, a lot of the sales type stuff that I was doing uh, kind of tangentially through consulting. Uh, and that led me through a number of, of coffee chats. I think someone mentioned coffee chats. Take as many of those as you can. Um, to talk to as many people as you can. I also thought product management would be good for me. It was immediately clear it was not um, through coffee <laughs> chats. Uh, and then that led me to, to business development, which has been the perfect fit for me. Yeah, I can go. Um, as Common Bond is the third role I have, I have had after business school. Um, so for me, um, going to business school was um, similar to what Tara was saying, intent, intended to be self-exploration, but I ended up going back to the same job I had before business school um, at a somewhat senior, more senior role um, after that, um, because during the time of self-reflection, I realized that I really liked what I was doing before business school. Um, and even with an MBA, I thought I could do more in that role. So um, it wasn't the immediate detour, I guess, and to use your words, um, that is, I think, more typical. Um, I often get asked a lot why, why I went back to my former employer, and I said, I really liked what I was doing. I thought I was good at it, and I had a good boss. Um, so sometimes it can be as simple as that. Um, for me, what happened was a few years later, I realized I wanted to do more. Um, and that's, I think, largely attributed to the fact that I spent two years at HBS and realized I could do more. Um, and so I wanted to think more strategically about, um, you know, within financial services. And so the natural next step for that was to join my company's internal strategy and M&A team. Um, which I was able to do. Um, so spent a few years doing that um, uh, internally at Morgan Stanley. And then for me, the jump to Common Bond um, was a bit methodical as well, um, not to play into the MBA stereotype, but I, had a, I knew I wanted to work in fintech and be a part of a company that was um, changing how financial services was being done, broadly speaking. So I made a list of all the different like verticals within fintech, listed companies and founders under all of that, um, started trying to meet as many people as I could at all of those companies um, and found my way to Common Bond, um, one, because it was in New York City and I didn't want to move, um, and two, um, I understood the business model, um, which I think is really important, and I think MBAs do a good job of doing this when they're looking at small companies. Um, understand how the company makes money um, before you join the company. Um, I think it's very critical and not enough people do that. 
Um, and, and third, I, it's a small company, so you have to get along with and believe in the founder and the founding team's vision. Um, really important, especially at a small size company. So for me, uh, Common Bond checked off those three boxes, and so um, I joined um, three and a half years ago. Now, I think of Common Bond as an MBA company because not only was it founded by MBAs, but obviously as proof uh, right here on the screen, um, Common Bond hires a lot of MBAs, and I know that um, it has a lot of summer interns uh, from uh, the top MBA programs. Um, and there are, you know, the classic MBA companies, uh, often in consulting like McKinsey, Bain, BCG, Deloitte, uh, and of course Morgan Stanley and Goldman and um, and uh, uh, Chase, uh, JP Morgan. They hire a lot of MBAs as well. Well, what is it? What is it like? And you're left, and to see another MBA beside you. Uh, and is it is it fun? In other words, do the Harvard MBAs pick on the Kellogg and Stern MBAs? <laughs> and do the Stern MBAs pick on the Harvard MBAs? How does that work? What's the culture like? <laughs> well, jokingly, I'm wearing my Harvard pants I was about today. to say, you're wearing your Harvard <laughs> pants today. <laughs> so uh, DC always gives me trouble for being a Harvard MBA. Loving trouble. Loving trouble. Loving trouble. Uh, for loving trouble. And so he had these really great pants. And I noticed them like two years ago. I was like, hey, those are great new pants, Dave. And he was like, yeah, they're my Harvard pants. And I was, they're like my special pants. And so now we joke every time he wears them, he's wearing his Harvard <laughs> pants, which I noticed. And I wasn't going <laughs> out. But so there is some loving teasing. But I think what's nice about it is we kind of um, have similar experiences that we can share. Because within uh, a startup environment, there are people that are like, hardcore startup veterans and have done this for a long time and probably came direct out of undergrad. And there are people at MBAs that fit that mold, but it's not as common. Um, and so I've found a lot of help and support in being able to rely on other MBAs here um, through transitions, even within Common Bond, and also just understanding how the company works, being able to share those similar experiences. So I think it's definitely a more collaborative and helpful environment because MBAs, it's not just a single person or two that have an MBA background. Right. I will also say that just because we have MBAs doesn't separate us from the other individuals here. Everyone mm -hmm. here at Common Bond is high performing. Uh, and we all work together whether they have one or not. And I think that's another important thing. You don't, you don't want to be, you know, bigger than other people because you have an MBA. It, it's three letters after your name. And if you put it after your name, you look kind of weird. So you don't even do that. Um, and we're all one team. Now. That's true. Whenever I see uh, on LinkedIn a profile of someone who has MBA after the name, uh, I'm shaking my head and wincing, <laughs> you know? Uh, he, he, here's kind of an interesting question. Um, what about for, you, you know, getting into a top MBA program like all of you did uh, often requires that you work before you go to grad school at a brand name type company. Not always, but sometimes. And one member in the audience is asking, if you got out of undergrad and you worked for a small fintech kind of company, uh, will that actually help them get into an elite MBA program? Any thoughts on that? Um, I, can, I can start by giving you just an example of um, someone that we had that worked here right out of college. Um, it was his, uh, it was a second job, but he had worked at a you know small regional bank um, and uh, came to Common Bond and um, did a phenomenal job here and is now at Wharton. So I, it certainly can happen. It's I think I actually think now that this is you know a lot more folks are going to startups out of college that um, startups present an amazing opportunity for somebody to go to a business school in that you have so much ownership um, and you can have so much ownership and um, if you see something, do it um, and you can own so, like so many like projects and processes and, and really important things that are going on at a company, um, no matter how old you are or what degree you have um, and you can really show that um, you know, you're, you're a true leader and that's, those are the types of things that um, you know, top MBA programs are always looking for. So I think it's actually a great story. Yeah, and I've, you know, top MBA schools, when you're, when you're telling your story, it's really about what is that unique experience you have? Where are you going? And how is that school's MBA program going to help, help you get there? I think that's kind of a really great structure to keep in mind. So as long as you can demonstrate 
those, you know, great skills and experiences that you have from wherever you worked. Um, you know, I worked at a large agent advertising agency before, but you know, that's not a typical necessarily MBA background. Um, so it's still about just demonstrating exactly what do you have today? Where do you want to go tomorrow? And do you have a clear way to get there using that school's opportunities and resources? Um, yeah. yeah, that's, that's a good point. I that as well, because I think the diversity is something that MBA programs strive to create. And so for me personally, I knew, okay, I went to a state school for undergrad. Um, I worked in automotive. Like those two things, um, the state school probably was not the biggest help, but the automotive industry and quite frankly, being a woman in the automotive industry definitely was something that was distinct. So I was able to tell the story of how I would add value by being more diverse um, through my background. So I think as long as you do share what is unique to you and how, as Jesse was saying, the MBA program in particular helps you continue on in your career vision, that's what's most important, not whether it's startup or big company. Right. Well, what backgrounds or experiences do you think uh, are most valuable to su succeed in a fintech startup? Well, I think the biggest thing is just being able to be flexible and, and kind of roll with things because there are going to be a lot of things that you can't plan for. Um, and, and just being able to kind of see the opportunities that are in front of you and, and react to them um, quickly and you know, thoughtfully, I think is really important to succeed. So, I mean, you could get that almost anywhere. Um, but just really being able to embrace that and kind of understand that ambiguity is not necessarily a bad thing. I right. Add, I think a lot of times people think that you have to have worked at another startup to get a startup job. I think there are um, opportunities to, to Sarah's point, like within big companies, even where you can have um, small teams or, or new initiatives that you can own and, and, you know, kind of really feel like what it is like to be on a small team and at a, you know, on a new, on a new project or a new idea. Um, and that experience is super helpful for a company like ours. So I, I think people always just like kind of get nervous, especially coming from big companies like, Oh, I don't know if you guys would value me or value my skill set, but there are certainly um, ways that you can show you have um, kind of a background that would thrive here at common bond. On that, actually, it's a, it's a great point to bring up uh, someone who's coming from a big company going to their MBA, trying to go to a small company afterwards. I think a huge opportunity that not a lot of people take uh, is to actually volunteer your time at a startup while you are in business school. Um, I remember I worked at a, a very small startup, it's actually no joke, it was in a garage behind a gas station. It's no longer here up on Houston. Um, but I did it, and it was actually an undergrad intern role, but I took it as an MBA just to get that experience as working at a small company as a probably 20 or 30 person company. Uh, and then when I talked to Phil, who actually ended up hiring me as, a, as the, uh, the intern, he said, one of the reasons why I knew you'd be able to cut it here is because you had that experience at a small company and you're not just a big government consultant, you're someone who can uh, really strive and work well in, in small teams. I think also when you're making pretty big transitions, try to isolate all the differences or basically minimize the differences. So for example, I was going from consumer products to financial services, but it was still within marketing um, and kind of been in marketing my entire career. So having that functional thread made that transition a little bit easier, even though I didn't have you know, financial services or technology. So going there, you know, had I tried to jump from consumer products to product management at a fintech company, that might've been a little bit more difficult with the technical kind of up speed, but you know, marketing from your MBA, learning about consumer behavior and the consumer journey and doing market research um, and, you know, understanding how to bring those to market in a cost-effective way that drives the business while still being under your CPA targets. I think all of those skills are still transferable. So I think just trying to figure out what are those transferable skills will instill confidence in the person sitting across the table when you're interviewing for a role that might seem like somewhat of a jump. I think one of the appeals uh, for MBAs of working in either a startup or an early stage company is the amount of authority that they have um, over whatever the domain may be. Can you compare how much authority you feel you have at Common Bond compared to what you had in the previous job? I mean, were you really a spoke in the wheel and you didn't see the wheel spin in the old job and here you're actually spinning yourself? What, what's, give me a sense of, uh, give me a sense of how the authority or the, your feeling about what you can do and what you can't do has changed. 
I, I'll start with that one. I'd never heard the, the wheel analogy there. So, um, that's a good one. Um, for me, it wasn't as much of, I didn't see the kind of end game or the goal of what I was working on and, or had, that hasn't really changed for me from my prior role to here, but it's more of, there's less layers. Um, um, like said simply, there's not, it, I was in a very hierarchical structure um, at a large bank and here there's a lot less layers, especially when I joined when it was 30 people, there were, you could argue no layers then. Um, and now, I mean, as any company grows, you start establishing more layers, but it, it was, um, it, it wasn't that I had to, when I was working on something, I'd have to like, you know, go through a whole process of checking with five different people before we were finished. Now it's just, when I'm done, I'm done. Um, and we can move on. And so it's, 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 it's very like liberating almost um, to, to not have all those layers. Now, Vina, you were working Saturdays and Sundays at Morgan Stanley, weren't you? <laughs> yep. Uh, are you, are, do you work, there, Saturday, so. do you work Saturdays and Sundays at Common Bond? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's one thing I would actually add is that people assume coming to a startup, it's a big mix misconception that like it's a very easy lifestyle. Um, I would say all of us would probably agree that in some ways it's probably more intense than prior work environments. And I certainly feel that way sometimes, even coming from an investment bank, um, just because there are less layers and less, um, you know, um, people to do stuff. Um, you have in, and everything you do is actually quite important. There's no busy work here. So, um, yeah, so I would like to dispel that notion. <laughs> yeah, I would just add to the point before around, do you join a startup so that you can have more responsibility um, and authority early on in your career? And for me, that was a decision point, definitely. Um, I think that you get more responsibility on both sides though. So more responsibility downstream, doing work that would have been more junior people would have done before, as well as upstream and having the ability to influence outcomes in a way that you wouldn't have before. So there, it comes with both things. You are the person that, and Dave actually was oftentimes initially the person that fixed the printer for everyone in the office. Like he was our IT I guy for, he, he still does. He still does. Um, <laughs> and even so though he are, wears the Harvard pants. Even with the, not on days when he wears the Harvard pants. But. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but so you do get both sides of the coin. I think the other thing that I was interested in is I didn't want to go back to an environment where the rules and their process would limit my ability to accelerate my career quickly. And so I wanted to join a place where if you were ambitious and showed competence, capability, and engagement, you would be able to progress. And it wouldn't be, you have to have been here for at least two years to get the promotion to senior manager. Um, and so that was important to me as well. And those both came into my methodical decision of where to join also. Another yeah. reason to join a startup uh, beyond just kind of increased responsibility is also, especially at a high growth stage startup is you also get to be in build mode and feel like you're really kind of creating parts of the future of the company, which is super exciting and was something new for me, you know, building out teams or thinking how might we do marketing in the future, for example, like you get to kind of create how we do things in addition to just having ownership of doing it yourself. So that's another area of a startup that I think is a really cool opportunity that I hadn't even focused on uh, before I joined. Now we have in the audience a bunch of international students and as we all know, uh, internationals who come to the US uh, face uh, some uncertainty over the whole visa situation. Uh, so one uh, person is asking, uh, do FinTech startups hire international students? Uh, or do they not have the infrastructure to do all the documentation and, and everything else to help uh, people uh, through that process? We have a number of people who work here who are here on a visa. Absolutely. Um, huh? Yeah. That's great to hear. Uh, we also have a question from someone uh, who just graduated with an executive MBA from the Kellogg School. And that person says uh, he's having a little trouble uh, kind of transitioning into a, a new and different role. He wants to pivot from one industry to another. Uh, I know, you know, Kamaban is a very young company and executive MBAs tend to be a bit older. Any advice for this guy? So, I mean, just 
projecting out, I think one of the things that um, Dave mentioned earlier about showing value and being able to show that you can cut it before you're asking for the investment effectively is, is huge. So understanding that as an executive MBA, he was effectively having two jobs. He was going to school and he was in his um, full-time career. Potentially now that he's completed, he or she has completed their MBA, um, they can go and do a side project for a startup or the industry that they're trying to transition to, to try to show that value before they're asking to get the job. That's a really important piece um, in being able to have someone take a chance on you because when you're switching careers, you are asking someone to take a chance. And so you just want to minimize the risk involved with that for the employer. Yeah, really good advice. That goes back to what Dave said about uh, taking an internship job in the garage in New York City, even though he was an MBA student, to get that startup experience and to convince others that uh, he was meant to work in a, in a high growth, uh, smaller type company. Fascinating. Um, do you have any uh, remorse about getting your MBA? Uh, or if you could go back, uh, was, is there any, something you would do differently? Um. Uh, I, I don't um, <laughs> have any remorse about getting my MBA. Um, it was expensive, but I think it was worth it. Um, it looks like most people here agree or everyone agrees with that. Um, uh, it, agree with yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, luckily you had your common bond loan to help out. <laughs> yeah, um, but uh, would I do anything differently? Um, I think uh, I would have tried more of the kind of startups in the garage um, projects that Dave mentioned in some shape or form. I did one of those when I was in business school um, where we consulted, me and a few friends consulted with a, um, a family owned sushi company um, about their strategic growth plans, um, which was really fun. And it was a three month project, but I did it my last three months in business school. So um, those types of things I think are not just, you know, really helpful to get real experience when you're in business school, but especially if you're trying to pivot roles or industries, are really helpful to show employers that you know what you're talking about and you've done it. Right. For my classmates who did relay to me that they didn't think the MBA was the right decision afterwards, um, the commonality among them was that the MBA didn't have a clear purpose. So they were before and after school, they were going back to the same industry and that industry didn't value an MBA, for instance, um, or they didn't know what they wanted to use it for. And so then afterwards they looked back and they said, oh, I would have done it differently. One of the best pieces of advice I got before entering the MBA program was um, by someone who had gone through the process before and they told me, Tara, before you start, write down what are the three things you're hoping to accomplish um, during your time there because you will have so many options thrown in your face that if you do not have a guiding light and principle that you can look back and say does this match with my objectives or not you'll end up not sleeping completely burning out and feeling like you didn't know what you did it for so I think going into an MBA program know why you're doing it and make it very clear write it down and remind yourself of it so that you don't get lost in the process. That's fantastic advice, and if you take away one thing, I think that's, that's absolutely right. You need to know why you're there. I was there to get a job. I got a job halfway through, so I moved to part-time. That's a, a great example of, of why you do what you do, and to make sure that once you get it, you, you move on, or you, you move on however you should. Um, I would say the, other, the one piece of advice I have that I wish I could have done before, I applied to NYU uh, later. I think I was a third round application. Uh, and so I didn't receive any scholarship money or anything like that. I, I did receive from other schools I had applied to before. Um, I really highly recommend uh, applying to your top choices in the first, the first go round if possible because that scholarship money does dry up. Uh, and second, negotiate that award letter. Um, if you, especially if you have two different schools that uh, you get into, play them off of each other. They will negotiate with you. You can get further scholarships, grants, other. Um, I know a lot of people who did not pay full way, and they did that because they were proactive about negotiating uh, that final cost. But you have to do that before you have your negotiation uh, class, right? <laughs> you got you to go on YouTube. <laughs> Here's a question. How do you know you're ready for a career in fintech? I mean, I don't know how you answer that, because I also think that on one level, that's less an important question than how do you know you're ready for marketing or strategy or operations? Because ultimately, no matter where you work, whatever company it is, you know, your day-to-day -day, uh, obsession 
uh, the thing that consumes you is your discipline primarily. So how, how do you answer the question? How do you know that you're prepared to work for a FinTech? So um, I, I literally just went through that decision process and I can talk to you about what my decision was, was and really what it was is I was working with a bunch of traditional financial institutions in terms of how they're gonna react to FinTech. And it was frustrating because a lot of them move really, really slowly or you know they're not like willing to take chances and things like that. And I, I just sat there, I was like, this is really frustrating because I actually want to do things and, and move forward and, and do things differently. And for me, that's when I decided, you know what, maybe this is the time um, and, and there was common bond, so it worked out well. But um, I think a big piece of it is when you know that you wanna do something that's different um, and that you wanna be able to take those chances, I think that's the right time to make that move. Right, yep. Anyone else? I think if you believe that kind of consumer finance and making consumer finance more accessible and easier to access and cheaper and kind of democratizing that landscape is when you're ready to move over to fintech just kind of because you are while you will be focusing on marketing or strategy you still also will be thinking through those industry dynamics day in and day out so when that is something that excites you um i think that's an important time to move because you'll be putting in a lot of hours and dealing with really difficult challenges. So if that's the type of challenge you want to work through, um, which is an exciting one, which I think is what we all came here to do is kind of improve consumer finance. That's kind of when it's ready to make the leap. So um, here's a question from the audience. Was there something you learned at school that you never expected to learn? Dave, what about you? Oh, really, you're going right here, right here to that. Let's put you on the spot. The, the, funny, the funny thing is I, uh, I did a finance undergrad at Georgetown and then came back and got my MBA. And I won't say it's something I knew, I, I learned, it's, it's learned again. I had totally forgotten accounting, everything associated <laughs> with accounting. I, did, I had to learn the whole thing over again. Um, so it, it's interesting because there are courses that I took two times over that were like, yeah, I totally forgot this, haven't used this, never will use this again. Uh, so it's really more about focusing on those areas that I know that I was going to use, uh, like the, the sales and the negotiation and the leadership type classes. One of the things, um, and my husband loves this joke, is he says that I made um, the most expensive friends I've ever had. And so he puts like <laughs> dollar amounts on my friends. And he's like, yep, Alan was $10,000. <laughs> John staff was 20. And, but it's very true. I didn't go there thinking I would find like my tribe of people, but I came out with some of, in fact, the closest friendships um, that I have. And I'm so grateful uh, for those friendships. And, and they were worth the cost, even though my husband definitely teases me about it. That's funny. I would say um, for me, uh, I had come from, I was a, from an investment banking background and I um, it really opened my eyes to different functional roles, I, I would say. So my intro to marketing class, my first year at HBS was like kind of eye opening because, you know, at a bank, your marketing team is just like they put the flyers out there on campus recruiting events, you know, and I'm uh, paraphrasing or, you know, their job, but um, it, they, I didn't fully understand the true value that can be driven from, um, you know, a marketing function, for example. And um, while I realized during that process that like, I wasn't a marketer. I, I like appreciated and respected the value that a strong marketing organization can have in driving um, consumers to your, your company. So that was it for me. So um, anyone else on that same question? What did you learn that you didn't expect to learn? Jesse, do you have a, an answer? I know. <laughs> I actually... <laughs> I really found my operations classes fascinating. I didn't think I was gonna. No, like, really. <laughs> That's cool. Throughput and rates and bottlenecks. I just think I I really appreciate classes like that that make you see the world in a different way. Like I think accounting was one. It fundamentally changes how you like frame and see the world. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Sarah, how about you? So. Uh, for me, a lot of it was about work-life balance. I'd always worked in financial services and like I was not exactly one that was really good about you know taking time for myself and things like that. But I think what I really learned in those two years, it sounds ridiculous, but 
to like step back, make sure you get sleep, make sure you get to the gym and, and you actually take care of yourself. And I, I didn't expect that to be a focus as, of, of as many classes as it was and as many guests as we had come they would always talk to us about how important that was and, and how much more successful it made them. And I think that that was my surprise takeaway from business school. Okay. Well, Sarah, how many, what percentage of the case studies were that you were assigned at Harvard? Did you actually read? <laughs> I'll be honest. I, I think in the two years I was there, there's only one case that I didn't read. Um, wow. That's really impressive. Crazy. I actually do. It was on Boston chicken, um, my first year in, in my accounting class. And I had what we called the RC plague, um, which was a strain of the Croatian flu that like just wiped us all out. And I literally could not read. That was the only reason why I didn't read it. For everyone out there, RC means required curriculum, which is the core at Harvard Business School. Yeah, sorry. That's okay. Uh, so here's a question. What are you most looking forward to with regards to Common Bond in the next few years? I mean, you're all uh, in a fast growth company. Um, I'm assuming that the learning you're getting in the job uh, is fast paced as well. Uh, if you look at your own careers over the next three, five years, what in fact are you looking forward to? Sarah, you have, a, you have the mic, so you may as well go first. Well, I think, um, you know, we're doing a lot of really exciting work, I think, with strategic partners and partnering with um, more established financial institutions. And I think that's really exciting to kind of see where that goes and, and you know, to help make that really successful. Um, yeah, so, that and, and, that's your, and that's your domain, so, <laughs> right. Yeah, from a marketing perspective, so obviously we started with MBA loans and we've since expanded into you know, refinance and enterprise solutions. So I think it's just continuing to build out new products, whether it be for other graduate students, um, different subsections of the population that we can provide value to is super exciting to me, just kind of marketing and building brand awareness with even more individuals that we can serve. Um, for me, I, I would say there's there's many things that um, kind of are exciting on the horizons for for Common Bond. But um, you know, one of the things that we've done recently is uh, we acquired a company called Next Gen Best, um, which is a um, AI based financial platform for Gen Z, which is the you know we call it tomorrow's millennials. It's folks in college and um, the I guess the earlier parts of college and in high school as well. Um, and being that trusted source for them as they are figuring out how to pay for college, how to figure out like which college to go to, um, and um, kind of that trusted platform, I think is really interesting as we continue to you know create products and services that help people um, you know pay for school and and figure out how to um, finance uh, their lives more generally. I would agree. I think it's really cool the direction we're going in, both in broadening our, our target audience, which is uh, going down the chain to Gen Z, as you mentioned, uh, but then also across products. Um, we, we, we are coming out with a, a new product uh, this year that, that we're very excited about. Uh, basically, it mimics our MBA product, but for the dental and medical markets. Um, we have a couple partners there that we think could be very successful. Um, and so it's really cool to be able to be a part of that. Um, that came from probably a, a year and a half or so of work from a, a small team here of a common bond. And it's, it's exciting to get your hands dirty and actually now hopefully see some results come in from it. Yeah. And on the enterprise side, you know, we basically help companies be awesome employers by supporting their employees with education debt. And so one of the um, solutions we provide is that we facilitate payments by a company directly to an employee student loan. Um, it's sometimes been termed a millennial 401k, but it's unfortunately not just needed by millennials. It's by every age demographic in the workforce. And what's exciting to me is we're seeing so much um, regulation and pending legislation that would allow for these benefits to be tax free so that companies can put money towards your student loans and you're not taxed on it. And I think that would just open up this burgeoning market where employers recognize that if they're requiring that you have a degree to get a job and they need to help you pay for that degree because it costs more than it ever did before. 
And I think one thing to piggyback off that, uh, this is a bit of a separate conversation, but really cool nonetheless, is the fact that that product, our CB4B product, was actually uh, built because of a business case made by our summer intern class about three years ago. Uh, oh, wow. And they looked at the market and did all the things that MBAs are great at from a strategic perspective um, and made the business case as to why we should go through and go to that market. And now we're one of the leaders in that market. It's pretty cool. It shows that not only do we value MBAs, we really value our interns. Uh, and they do a lot of very meaningful work here. You're not going to get coffee like you do some places. <laughs> I think, I think, you know, l uh, listening to all of you, what's kind of exciting is that, you know, the, because the firm is expanding fast, uh, you're now looking at adjacent fields uh, to enter. And, and you're looking at the nuances of what you're doing to do it better. Uh, so it's just it's not maintaining or in the, in the original product line that Common Bond had. So, so I think that there's a, probably a lot of opportunities there uh, to, to explore new areas that are adjacent to the markets that you're in uh, and to launch a lot of new products that you aren't in, uh, already in. I have uh, one last question here. To, where our, our time is running out. And uh, I wanna ask Tara this question because her husband puts a value on all her Harvard Business School friends that she acquired uh, by paying the, the outrageous tuition at Harvard. Um, what dollar value do you put on your husband? Oh. <laughs> this is the easiest question because he's priceless. Oh, I like that. And I'm sure he will too. So really my serious last question is this, you know, obviously there are a lot of uh, people who are in applicant mode uh, or who are about to start an MBA program in the fall. I wonder, you know, what piece of advice might you give them uh, before they actually show up on campus? What, what did you wish you knew uh, when you started your MBA program that you didn't know? Yeah, it's all about focus. Know why you're there. Know the number one reason why you're there. Much like Tara said before, write that down. And every decision you make uh, should be furthering that, whether it's building a company. Well, if you build a company while you're in business school, you have access to free labor of really smart people. You have access to great advisors. It's a fantastic thing to do. But then you also shouldn't go and do the consulting path, right? If you want to build a company in business school, build a company in business school. If you want to go down the consulting path, that should be your number one goal. Yeah, the case studies are important and all that stuff, but your goal should be meeting every single consultant that's out there, right? So really have a focus for your business school. It is an extremely expensive way to go through two years if you don't have a plan in place. Yeah. yeah and um, I would just also say probably chill out a little bit because I think that <laughs> most people that go to MBA programs are most of them are very type A, very driven. They have plans or they don't have plans, but they just do it all to cover all the potential plans that could be. Um, and you can't mess up your business school experience by not going to one event or not doing this one thing. Like, so don't think that every decision is the decision that will be the end of, of the world. Sarah? Yeah, I would add to that. Um, make sure you take some time off before you arrive on campus. I didn't do that and I really regret it. Um, but you know, your employer probably really values you and they're gonna try to convince you to stay as long as possible, but they will survive without you. Um, and, and taking that time to like make sure you, you're ready for, for campus is really important too. Um, one thing you I would know, say, yep, sure. <laughs> um, advice. Uh, I would say um, the relationships you're building are, um, you know, they, people always talk about the network and it being really important, but they're extremely valuable. And so the same way you would, you know, um, you know, colleagues or, or, you know, if you're meeting new friends, like kind of nurture them and take the time to, to get to know people because so much of the value from an MBA from one of these top schools is really the network. And I'll say now having been um, out for a number of years is, um, you know, people pop up in all different contexts over, over the course of your career, whether it be now in a professional context versus a social context before. Um, and I've seen this happen a number of times for myself in the last few years, whether they're investors or vendors or, um, you know, folks that we as a business want to work with or want to work with us. Um, so, uh, you know, take these relationships seriously. And Jesse, your advice. 
So I think it's fun to take some time and kind of reach out to alumni from your school a few years out before you start more just to get their advice on how to approach the MBA or see, you know, what they're, if they're, what they're doing is interesting to learn more about their role. Cause I think a lot of times people start reaching out to alumni when there's a job posting or when like recruiting season is in the moment. And I think it's much better to take some time when, you know, you're not neurotic and freaking out about jobs and internships to really just learn and hear how other people approached it so that you can make the right decision. And then you take that fall semester to evaluate what you heard over the summer in the context of classes so that you're really prepared and really focused when it comes time to recruiting versus feeling like you have to have 800 coffee chats about consulting and 800 about banking and 800 about marketing. And all these alumni are getting conference calls at the same time. So really building those relationships early at a more approachable pace so that you can chill out, you can focus on what's important to you versus just feeling like it's a madhouse. Great. Hey, great advice. It was a terrific spending a little time with you today. Uh, Dave, Jesse, Vina, uh, Tara, and Sarah, uh, thank you for your time. And I hope Tara's husband was watching this <laughs> and found out that he was totally priceless uh, today. And in the live stream. That's right. And when you when you go home, if there aren't a bouquet of flowers on the counter, boy, you you better be complaining. Hey, <laughs> so thank you everyone to come on. And I just want to tell everyone, you know, we have a pre MBA networking festival in New York. We do it every year. Common Bond from the very beginning uh, has been a sponsor. Uh, so is McKinsey, Bain, BCG, uh, Google, Amazon, Morgan Stanley, uh, JP Morgan Chase, uh, Goldman has participated, LinkedIn, uh, Microsoft, uh, companies that are the mainstream employers of MBAs, uh, and you get to visit them. You go in their offices, hear from uh, executives, partners, uh, and get to actually network with people who are willing to give you their calling cards, their home phone numbers, uh, their email addresses. Uh, it's amazing how helpful uh, people are uh, to, to really what is an audience of people who've been admitted to a great program, but have not yet stepped foot on campus. Uh, and it's all about uh, what Dave suggested and what a number of you suggested here today, uh, figuring out what you really want. Uh, the earlier you figure that out, uh, the more likely you are gonna be successful at achieving your dream job uh, right out of school. So uh, thanks to all of you. And I will see you uh, during the festival, I'm sure, uh, at Common Bond. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hey, this is John Byrne with Poets and Quants. Uh, and I have five great people there at Common Bond in New York City. Thanks for joining us.